Good afternoon. Uh, my name is JJ Spoon, and I'm the director of the European Study Center here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, today's uh, conversation on Europe is uh, focused on 25 years of the single market. Uh, thank you for uh, those of us who are joining us here, as well as those who are joining us remotely. Um, today's conversation is sponsored by the European Study Center, as well as the University Center for International Studies. Our co-sponsors today who are joining us remotely um, are the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at Florida International University and the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Um, and thank you to uh, the staff of the European Study Center for um, organizing uh, today's event. Uh, so, uh, and we're being joined uh, by more people as, as, we, as we start. Um, so before we, we get into our, into our discussion, I want to provide a bit of background um, on uh, the topic uh, that we're going to be focusing on, which is the, uh, the European single market and the 25 year um, anniversary um, of its existence. Um, so the free movement of goods and people and the creation of a common market was a goal of the European Union as far back as the Treaty of Rome, which created the European community in 1957. The six original members of France, Germany, Italy, uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, and the Netherlands long believed that there couldn't be a common Europe without a common market. The first notable move in this direction was the removal of customs duties on goods circulating between member states, um, and this was uh, initiated in 1968. But it wasn't until 1985 that the European Commission, under the leadership of President Jacques Delors, um, in which a, uh, it, the, uh, there was a proposal for a single internal market. This was largely um, in response um, at the time to the oil crisis of the late 1970s and the subsequent inflation and rise of in unemployment in, in Europe. The ambitious creation of a single market would be completed in stages and finalized in 1993 and was included in the Single European Act, which was ratified by the then 12 member states in 1987. On January 1st, 1993, the borders between the EU member states ceased to exist. This opened up the free movement of goods and services as well as capital and people, known as the Four Freedoms, and was the single largest move towards economic integration the EU had ever seen. The single or common market has not, however, been without its challenges, both from within the EU with the expansion to 28 countries, and perhaps now back to 27 with Brexit, and outside the EU with the increasing influence of China in the European market, among others. It is to these challenges, as well as to the future of the single market that we now turn to uh, with our panel of distinguished scholars, um, who I will now introduce, um, two of whom are, are seated next to me uh, 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 in Pittsburgh. Um, the first is uh, Jude Hayes, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Minnesota and previously taught at the University of Michigan and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Professor Hayes's work focuses on the interconnections between domestic politics and the international economy. <laughs> His book, Globalization Between, excuse me, Globalization and the New Politics of Embedded Liberalism, was published by Oxford University Press. And his research has also been published in Political Science Research and Methods, the British Journal of Political Science, Political Analysis, and Comparative Political Studies, among other journals. Professor Hayes is also Associate Editor of Political Science Research and Methods. Um, to my right is Erica Owen, who is Assistant Professor in the Graduate School of International and Public Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh. She received her PhD from the University of Minnesota, and she previously taught at uh, Texas A&M uh, University. Professor Owens' research focuses on the political economy of, uh, of trade and foreign direct investment, and the politics of labor and multinational firms. Her work has been published in the Comparative, in comparative Political Studies, International Studies Quarterly, the Review of International Political Economy, International Interactions, and the British Journal of Political Science, among other journals. And joining us remotely is uh, Valtro Shepley, who is Associate Professor at the European Institute at the London School of Economics. She is also an Adjunct Professor of Economics at the Free University of Berlin. Professor Shepley received her PhD from the University of London and her second doctorate from the University of Heidelberg. Her research focuses on the European Monetary Union, European integration, financial markets, and social policy. Her book, The Political Economy of Monetary Solidarity, Understanding the Euro Experiment, was recently published by Oxford University Press. And her research has also been published in the Journal of European Public Policy, the Review of International Political Economy, and the Journal of European Integration, among other journals. The recipient of several grants, she is currently co-PI on a European Research Council grant called Solid Policy Crisis, uh, Crisis and Crisis Politics, Sovereignty, Solidarity, and Identity in the EU Post-2008. 
So welcome to all three of you and thank you for joining us today. So before we uh, turn to the challenges and the future of the common market, I thought it would be good to start out with some of, some of the basics. Um, so Jude, if we could perhaps start with you um, and talk a bit perhaps about uh, how the development of the single market fits into the post-World War II plan for political and economic stability and order. Okay, thanks, uh, JJ. So as everyone can tell from the uh, Professor Spoon's introduction, I'm not actually uh, a, a European Union expert, uh, but I study the political causes and consequences of economic integration. And clearly uh, Europe is uh, an extremely important example of uh, international economic integration. So I'm someone who believes that there are very significant political benefits um, that come as a result uh, of economic integration. And I wanna talk briefly uh, about those political benefits within the context of the post-World War II um, economic and, and political order. So I believe there are benefits, but at the same time, economic integration is a process that has to be managed very carefully uh, because it's a process that creates both uh, winners and losers, broadly defined. So clearly economic losers, but also uh, perceived cultural losers as, as well. And those losers uh, are the potential opponents of uh, continued economic integration. That's kind of provides the basis on which these political benefits, um, which I mean uh, when I say that um, peace and, and stability, uh, the basis on which this uh, benefits uh, rest. So um, I think there are really uh, two different levels um, at which we uh, um, see really important political benefits that, that come as a result of economic integration in, in Europe. I mean, clearly, um, there are political uh, benefits uh, for Europe. So in the post-World War II period, it almost goes without saying that we've observed remarkable levels of stability in Western Europe. And we can debate uh, about how much causal influence we should attribute to economic integration. Uh, but there's definitely been stability. And I think sometimes we forget the uh, original political motivations behind uh, the European integration project, uh, which quite literally was to tie the interests and fates of France and Germany so closely together that the idea of conflict between them uh, is just unthinkable. Uh, and I, I think in that sense, uh, uh, the project has worked very well. And like I said, uh, we've observed remarkable political stability uh, in Europe over the post-World War II period. Um, but there's there's also another level at which I think economic integration in Europe um, provides important political benefits and that's at the, the global level. So at some point, you know, at the, the origins, you know, at the end of the, the Second World War, um, you know, primarily the United States and the United Kingdom decided uh, that they wanted to create a liberal international economic uh, order. And there were some differences uh, opinion, of opinion between Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes about the details, but some, they both wanted to, to move um, to something like what we observed uh, in, in terms of the international economy prior to the onset uh, of World War I. And at some point it was decided that European economic integration was really important to that process, which wasn't obvious at the time because you were creating regional integration, which seems to be, seemed to be in conflict with the idea of a liberal multilateral uh, economic order. But I think there were two primary reasons. One is that you couldn't build that order without peace and stability in Europe. So it was important in that sense. Uh, but there was also a view that a united Europe would become a very important political actor and ally uh, in sustaining the uh, global economic order. And I think that's that's exactly uh, what we've seen. Um, and now with uh, the current US administration uh, abdicating its leadership role, um, maybe the um, take over a very important leadership role when it comes to the, the uh, global economy. But, so I just wanted, as a political scientist, I wanted to, to focus on those kind of two levels of uh, political benefits that uh, I associate very strongly with 
uh, the success of economic integration in, in Europe. Um, and yeah, so that's my two cents. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And I want to get back to the, the US later in the, in the conversation. Um, Walter, I was wondering if you could um, perhaps talk a bit about um, some of the, the nuts and bolts of the of the single market and perhaps focus a bit on sort of the financial and social integration um, that we've mm -hmm. seen over the last 25 years. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, one tiny little correction of, and a very kind introduction is that I did both of my uh, economic doctorates at the Free University of Berlin. So that must somehow be with the publication of this, this works. Um, nuts and bolts of the single market. Um, that's fine. Uh, the single market is actually more about alignment and harmonization of regulation and rules than the absence of tariffs, which most people might think when they think of trade and, and, and the market. Mm -hmm. So this is really the core of the single market project. The, the, the absence of tariffs was agreed uh, basically from the start. Um, and it's of course more about economic commercial integration, uh, the freedom of capital, financial and other human services, goods, uh, persons across borders. So much so that people take a lot for granted. And this is something you notice now when you live in the country that is about, for the first time, a country leaving that European Union. We discover every day, basically, what we had taken for granted. There have been studies done that if, if by the Imperial College of London, if just uh, the border uh, control of every lorry takes two minutes, you have a tripling of queues there. So 29 miles up the M20 and the, the villages on the road to Dover are already up in arms about what that would mean for them. Um, there has been surveys of, of supply chain managers, 1,300 of them this September, who basically say if, if we have these border controls, one in 10 firms in Britain will go bust because the system is so much now adjusted to this trade with the EU and often from the mainland or from Ireland to the rest of the world, that if you cut this off, it has a massive impact on your economy. Um, but the, the, apart from the economic integration that we, that we all know, that is of course also the alignment of rules that meant for the city of London to be the gateway for the rest of the world into continental Europe. And this is now uh, threatened. So um, firms are already hedge funds, for example, uh, have in the last two years, without making much noise about it, have uh, retracted assets to the tune of 1 trillion uh, euros. And some headquarters start to move, or at least trading rooms start to move to Dublin, to Amsterdam, to Paris and Frankfurt. These are the four destinations in the rest uh, of Europe. The City of London will not go away. It has a lot of other business that's not EU related and it has also certain advantages, but it will certainly be diminished quite a bit. Now, whether that's all negative for, for Britain, that can be a, a point of discussion. Um, and the final, the social integration comes, of course, through the free movement, much more than that parallel, you know, in the 2000s, there was a whole agenda to complement the single market, which was very much uh, economic agenda, to complement that by social Europe. I don't think that has gone very far. It's not completely without achievements, in particular in gender equality or um, ex uh, exchanging experiences about how you can, for example, fight child poverty. But overall, the social Europe agenda was not very much. What, what really drove social integration was freedom of persons. It was meant to be just the freedom of workers. So you had to have employment before you could move. But over time, it just extended to the family of the worker. You could just not refuse 
for a worker to have the spouse and the children come and extend the rights to them. So child benefits or that mm -hmm. your adolescent child cannot be deported when it's found doing a bit of drug dealing and things like that, which is also part of social policy after all. And then it even extended to the non-workers. Uh, so pensioners and students have got rights to social assistance or to health care if they have established uh, real roots in a country, and that is usually assumed after five years. That has gone much further than anybody ever anticipated, and sometimes member state governments fight, especially with the European Court of Justice, which was a major actor in this, this area. But we can now really say that citizens that move across borders and even and, and workers as well as non-workers uh, do enjoy pretty much the social entitlements and therefore the right to social rights has no longer the basis the basis of these social rights is no longer employment but actually residence and residence in another country doesn't prevent you from from getting this so the single market in that respect with its four freedoms goods services capital and persons has gone quite far and as i would say in the background of the brexit debate here so far that people often don't notice that they're actually drawing on a right that the European Union uh, gives them, the single market gives them. Uh, we notice it only when it's withdrawn or about to be withdrawn. Thank you. And, uh, was that enough nuts and bolts? Yes, no, that was great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and we'll get back to, to Brexit, which of course is sort of looming over this entire discussion. Um, in, in a bit. Um, Eric, I was wondering if you could um, perhaps maybe talk a little bit more about what Walter um, uh, began to talk about in terms of um, what the, this, uh, the single market has meant for labor and, and, and uh, the labor market more generally. Sure. So um, I'm also more of a, an IPE person, so um, some of my comments are sort of just generally what uh, integration of how I think about globalization has meant in the context of Europe. So um, in the single market, you know, we can think about the distributive effects of this integration uh, for workers, both within countries and between countries. Um, so within countries, say Germany or France, uh, for instance, even the most sort of simple model of trade would say, you know, um, greater openness is going to benefit, you know, high skill workers in these relatively high skill abundant countries um, and, you know, harm less skilled workers in those same countries and benefit the less skilled workers in uh, you know, labor abundant economies. Um, and so, you know, so if you have these sort of expectations that uh, certain sets of workers are going to benefit from this integration uh, and other workers are going to be harmed. Um, and the free movement of people would have sort of similar effects, we would think, to sort of trade in goods and services, right? If low skill workers uh, look from low wage countries are moving to these more uh, skill abundant, higher wage economies, that's going to have a sort of similar effect on. Uh, the wages of, um, you know, low wage workers. So Eastern expansion uh, to sort of include countries like Poland um, has sort of put downward pressure on the welfare of low skill workers in Germany as German companies have the ability to either build plants in Poland or facilities in Poland or to have workers come uh, from Poland to work in German factories. Um, so that's sort of about what's happening within countries that can create some of these political pressures uh, that, that have been mentioned. Um, between countries, we can also see sort of differences in the, you know, sort of fate of these countries um, in terms of both specialization and distribution of income between countries. Um, so these middle income countries in the EU in particular, you could think Spain, Italy, Greece, um, have become less competitive uh, both Within the single market, as a result of sort of Eastern expansion, you know, their wages there are higher compared to some of the newer members, um, as well as through trade with, um, you know, sort of rising trade with countries like China. And so you can sort of see that there's this pressure both on middle classes um, and middle income countries in sort of a global sense. Um, and there's some work on this uh, by, by Brandon Milanovic, which sort of is talking about, um, you know, the distribution of income. Uh, sort of across countries also having sort of important uh, political uh, implications. I think the, the other point that, I, that I'd like to make sort of generally is that this integration has really led to a shift in the distribution of 
the economic pie in favor of capital relative to workers. Um, and so, you know, it's in some of my own work, but this has been documented across a wide number of studies. Uh, what we see is sort of in the decline of the labor share. Um, and so um, with some co-authors I looked at, the ratio of compensation to profits, and you could see across all types of countries in these advanced economies, um, regardless of labor market institutions, uh, a decline in the share of the gains going to labor relative to capital. And so one example is Germany in the 1980s, the ratio of compensation, you know, how much compensation goes to workers to, uh, relative to profits was about three and a half. Um, and in 2001, 2007, the average uh, fell to 2.4, which is a decline in the share going to labor of 30%. Um, so just sort of the balance has, has shifted in it in important ways. And so the biggest factor here is the increased bargaining power of capital, right? So not only do firms have the ability to relocate their plants within the single market to lower wage uh, locales, they have access to lower wage workers uh, from these lower wage countries that are part of the single market. And, and of course, they also have uh, the ability to automate, right? So uh, they can you know, sort of retool their facilities to be more capital intensive. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that this is creating sort of conditions, again, across, you know, across a variety of different types of labor markets, um, conditions where it makes it difficult for workers to sort of um, influence politics in the same ways that they used to, right? So this shift in economic power has sort of uh, implications for shift in uh, political power as well. Um, and so, you know, I, while I want to emphasize that there are these many benefits to integration um, as a whole, uh, in terms of workers that have been left behind, we're starting to see sort of, and, and we could have anticipated some of these backlashes uh, that we're witnessing. Um, and so compensation policies uh, to help those who've been hurt by integration have, I think, been successful in generating support for free trade. Uh, as some of Jude's work, Jude's work shows, but um, you know these economic pressures are just finding different outlets. Whether that's you know sort of support for right wing parties or um, hostility to immigration, I think these are sort of um, sort of big questions uh, that that need to be dealt. You know, sort of need to be, yet to be answered. Yes, no, absolutely. Thank you very thank you very much. And again, we'll um, I think circle back. I think you've all sort of raised some of the the many challenges that um, we're now seeing. Um, definitely be getting back to talk to, in terms of talking about um, the far right immigration and populism in, in a bit. Um, I wanted to um, turn to for a minute though um, and uh, uh, to both uh, Jude and, and Erica and talk a little bit perhaps more about sort of trade um, more generally and sort of the EU as um, as a trading partner um, and is the, the single market as a trading partner and if we think about sort of how this relates perhaps to Sort of globalization, the globalizing of Europe, and then and the, the globalization of the European market more generally, and sort of how the, the single market um, over the last 25 years has really contributed to that. Um, so, I don't know if you want to maybe take that to, to start. Um, sure, yeah. So, so as I mentioned in, in my comments, I think that um, a unified Europe has been uh, a very important force for. Um, uh, promoting the, the global uh, economic order, um, uh, post-World War II uh, economic order. I mean, it's always been, um, you know, we talk about the, uh, the quad with respect to uh, leadership in the WTO, and that's America and Canada and uh, the, the EU and, and Japan. And uh, so uh, the EU has always played, uh, I think, a, a very important role in managing the, the international trading system. And like I said, probably uh, a more important role um, now more than ever uh, with the current US uh, administration. Um, so I think there's definitely that really uh, important leadership role. At the same time, there's been noticeable conflict uh, between uh, the, the U.S. And, and Europe with respect to, to trade disputes. I don't know, Erica, if you know, but I think it's the U.S. and the EU that have um, the most trade disputes of any other I think that's diode of, of countries. So there, there have been, there's a long history of um, 
uh, you know, not disputes about the, the overall system, but uh, there, there have been uh, periods of, of conflict, whether it's uh, genetic, genetically modified organisms or, or other things. Um, but uh, that um, conflict has kind of hit a, a, a new high, I think, uh, with the, the Trump administration. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just sort of build on that, right? Like it, it, that's the, generally speaking, tariffs are fairly low with, between the two countries. And so the things to be resolved are sort of the difference in the way that they say approach regulations like regarding safety, um, you know, um, the, the, you know, the US is like, if it hasn't been shown to prove to be a problem, then it's probably safe. And the EU approach to say, you have to prove that it's safe. Um, it's like one of these sources of tension between the two going forward. They also have sort of uh, quite different approaches to sort of, you know, some of the commitments that they made in the WTO in terms of, you know, how they think about um, anti-dumping and countervailing duties. And so, right, that tension there, I think, poses, uh, poses a challenge, not just for them sort of in terms of uh, their interactions with each other, but also sort of just generally speaking, you know, um, I don't think the, the, the the way that they get along inside the context of the WTO, or not. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so actually, um, before we turn, um, kind of shift the, the discussion to um, many of the challenges that um, were raised and thinking more towards the future, I wanted to um, take a moment to see if, it, if there were any questions from either our audience here, or I think we have several uh, individuals and, and groups online. Are there any questions um, from what has been that already. Rob uh, Thank you. Um, I have a question for Professor Owen and, and, and a challenge for my colleague, Professor Hayes. The question <laughs> is that about the, the advantage to uh, companies that has accrued from the single market. And the argument was, you know better than I, was that they were in favor of it because it would reduce transaction costs um moving across borders as you say low labor and i think the argument was it would it would re, it would result in lower costs or lower prices for individual consumers and they would be sort of happy with it because their life would get easier because things would be cheaper my question is has is there any data on that has has that happened my challenge to you judy is to your statement that <coughs> the eu to, either alone or together with the United States, will, will be an increasingly significant, or is and will be a increasingly significant global actor. But in fact, as you know, the share of either the EU or alone, alone or with the United States, their share of global output, of global trade, of global finance, of global capital has sharply declined in the last decade or so. So couldn't one argue that the role of the EU, let's say, the single market, uh, is in fact reducing rather than increasing. Sure, uh, so that's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of any data on the uh, EU specifically, but there has been some recent research looking at whether uh, openness and to, to trade actually uh, leads to lower prices from consumers. And it seems that you know the answer is somewhat yes, uh, but that these firms have been pretty successful at actually holding on to a lot of the profits uh, that accrue from further integration. Um, one of the benefits that consumers do see is in terms of quality of products and sort of variety. And so, uh, you know, that, that was a study from, I, I believe, looking at firms in India. So I don't know how exactly much it translates, but I do think in general, these firms have been fairly successful at uh, Holding on to profits relative to sort of gains to shocking. consumers. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I guess I agree with with your premise, Ron. That um, uh, you know there there are certainly all these emerging market economies that are going to play a much more central role in the, the management of the global economy in the, in the future. But we always have these transition periods um, that are really important. So like the transition from the UK to the US uh, as leader. And so I think that the EU, if not 
the U.S. is going to play a very important role in sort of transitioning from the sort of traditional powers with respect to managing the global economy and, and passing on the, the mantle to the Chinas and the Indias and the Brazils um, and the, the like. Um, it's all about, um, so I believe very strongly in sort of the engagement approach to international relations. And so it's really important to engage and bring these new actors into the system. And I think uh, at, at this moment, I don't have very much faith in the United States um, being able to do that effectively. And so um, my hope rests with, with the EU, uh, unless we have significant changes in US politics, which fingers crossed. <laughs> Yeah, one thing. But I think, as Eric had mentioned, uh, to your point, uh, the regulatory powers of both sides is is what um, makes an impact on the global stage. And so, vis-a-vis -vis the emerging markets, uh, it will it will definitely be the competitive advantage that the West, let's call it, has. And, and in that respect, I think. You know, the EU has a great deal to, uh, um, you know, to, sh to share, but also to, uh, you know, offer. Walter, did you want to? I think I, I agree with this. And the example is where the EU often. I mean, first of all, I think these whole these projections that, you know, by 2050, I think the US and the EU combined have only one third of world GDP while they had. Uh, in 2000, two thirds or something. First of all, I don't think one should worry about that too much. If the living standard can be kept in the US and the EU, it just means the rest of the world gets a bit richer and that's uh, way overdue. So we should all be happy about that. The, however, the, the regulatory power, as the, the previous speaker just said, doesn't have not follow from your GDP. Uh, otherwise, China would already have to be a much bigger regulatory uh, uh, rule setter. You see it every time the IMF or the World Bank gets a new president. Each time we have good candidates in emerging markets, but they cannot agree among themselves to get one. And with complex regulation like the world financial system, they have even less capacity and arguably other priorities than setting the rules for that. And I'm afraid what will happen is, for example, the ECB now being one of the biggest rule setters, not because it actively seeks to set the rules for everybody else, but it sets it for one of the biggest, actually the biggest banking market in the world. And that has, has consequences for all others. In fact, US firms often lobby the federal government to take the EU rules because you inside the EU, uh, US you don't have that same harmonization that the EU single market has created. And so for them, it is a huge transaction cost if they trade with the EU to have the rules of the EU and then the rules of 52 or 50 states that have not completely harmonized rules. And so they would actually do better with having the EU rules. And these kind of market pressures give the EU more weight than its GDP 30 years down the line, and even today, uh, would warrant. Uh, do you have any other questions at, at this point? So, question, Erica. So, you mentioned about this idea of automation. Plants, they can either choose to automate or um, just lo relocate to Romania, Bulgaria, like that. Um, so, typically, in our own discourse here in the States, it's always this, the automation argument that the, the main losers out to labor is mainly due to, to automation. And so in Europe, is it the same or is the relocation from of a factory from Sicily to Romania, is that actually a more common thing rather than an automation argument? That's a great question. It's a, a big source of debate. And I guess my view is that it's hard to look at them separately because you know, um, if you if you try and restrict firms' ability to relocate, then they will automate. And if you know, if you try, so, so 
you can't just say that it's automation and not like relocation because these two policies um, are, you know, both affecting firms' decisions. Uh, and so, you know, this carrier example in the United States is what, you know, usually comes to mind, right? Um, we try to incentivize them to stay in the United States. They still move some plants abroad and, you know, they retool uh, and invest to like upgrade their facility to use a different strategy. So to me, I think, um, you know, globalization is easier to, to blame in the sense that, you know, it seems, you know, maybe unfair or you know, wages are lower, but um, that we can't really think about sort of firm strategy and therefore sort of the implications for workers without thinking about them together. And so I would suspect that it's similar in, in the EU, I, uh, but I can't think of like a great examples, you know, that are fresh examples. <laughs> great. Any other comments before we sort of turn to um, uh, the challenges, right? And this is obviously something that um, all three uh, of our panelists have already um, alluded to, whether it's um, thinking about sort of the, the, the backlash and support for the, the far right, for example, um, Brexit, um, and then of course, and many others, including um, the decline in support for the EU that we've been seeing, um, the rise of Euroscepticism, obviously Euroskeptic parties, um, China, India, Brazil, right, all of these things. Um, and so I uh, will sort of throw it to the to the panelists, whoever might whoever wants to jump in and and and, and tackle one of these topics. Um, do, do you want to want to start? Uh, sure. I mean, I, you know. <laughs> any of them. <laughs> uh, I guess the, the the challenge that that worries uh, me the most is is the rise of these uh, Euroskeptic populist parties and the, the success that that these parties seem to be having and um, you know it's uh, obviously very different from the interwar period but uh, reminds me somewhat um, the language and ideas and, and that makes me nervous very nervous um, so uh, I'm hopeful um, you know, Erica talked about compensation as a, a strategy to to maintain political support for um, projects like like European integration, and Europe's actually done a very good job of it relative to the United States. So, um, compensating losers, uh, and so I'm I'm hopeful that um, there are political strategies for the mainstream parties that can allow them to successfully promote economic uh, integration um, and probably combine with some sort of more effective uh, compensatory uh, approaches. Although the, the more cultural dimensions now um, and fears about immigration and, and the like um, are more difficult to, to tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. I don't know. That that's the challenge that that keeps me up at night, when <laughs> thinking about what the the mainstream political response should be uh, to these parties. And I hope that they they don't abandon um, their commitment to, to mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, and we know that we see a lot of you know the, many of these parties, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, the, well, the, the mainstream parties are trying to figure out how best to respond to. Um, these challenges from the right, and some, you know, you see a more sort of accommodating of some of these, you know, more anti-EU, Euroskeptic, um, populist sorts of positions um, as well. I'm wondering maybe you could bring it back a little bit to the to the single market, um, and so kind of tying in this concern about the rise of these um, of these far right parties and how the 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 single market and its free movement of people and goods and services and all of this kind of ties into either the rise of these parties or sort of what's um, really kind of pushing them forward. Yeah, I don't think we have a full grasp um, of that yet. I mean, one of the, the things that to me is, is very interesting um, and something that, that I'm doing research on cur currently is how economic integration relates to these cultural concerns that, that people have. And um, because one of the, the things that we see is that, I mean, knowing who is a, a loser as a result of the process of economic integration gives us some leverage in understanding um, 
who supports and who opposes economic integration. But there's a whole lot of variance that we aren't explaining with that. And so um, uh, there's something, there's, there's a connection that's out there between economic change as a source of cultural fear, right? So, um, and it's, it's not directly running through um, entirely the people who are economic winners and, and losers. And so, so my initial response is, well, there's the economic loser story and, and that's part of what's going on, but it goes beyond mm -hmm. economic losers. And yet at the same time, it seems to be sparked by economic change associated with integration and mm -hmm. sort of figuring out what those connections are is I think really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Erica or Walter, do you want to jump in with any of those? Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you that somehow one doesn't believe the purely materialist uh, uh, explanations. On the other hand, it's also not completely unrelated again taking the experience here from, from uh, the United Kingdom, uh, there, was, uh, there was at certain points, even in this liberal country, there was uneasiness with all this free movement and even things like having just workers come temporarily uh, to do construction work, for example, the so-called posting of workers. That was uh, a regulation under the freedom of services that was introduced in the in the early to uh, late 1990s. It was a response of the richer member states to southern uh, European integration, and they wanted to make sure that you know not all rules of labor regulation could be undercut by these posted workers so that the, the construction workers, the resident construction workers, for example, would also be protected. And they did it by asking that eight minimum conditions of the host countries, uh, labor law has to be observed, for example, the minimum wage. This created such an upheaval, and there were cases in the U UK as well, that this was not enough to protect resident workers. That in the meantime, this has become more or less the obligation after a relatively short time to completely transfer the labor law and the wage structure of the take over that host country. So that actually posted workers employed in another member state sent to another country for sometimes months, sometimes years, cannot be easily uh, done anymore, or at least not legally undercut other uh, member states. And that even in this liberal country, this was an issue. And it, the EU went the protectionist way, the way you just said. Uh, on the other hand, it can also not be the whole story because we found that those you know, the whole Brexit debate turned and that was the trick that this UKIP party, uh, UK Independence Party uh, pulled off was to make the, the decision to get out of the EU a debate about free movement and immigration and fudged everything from refugees to asylum seekers to economic migrants from the EU and from the rest of the world. This was all one immigration debate. However, when you then looked at the, the Brexit vote, it was highest where you had least migrants living. So in, there was a, a perfect negative relationship between people uh, voting for Brexit, for the exit from, from the EU, and the, the, the daily experience with the presence of, of migrants. So something is there that is fear for a kind of England, because it was mainly England, Wales as well, but Scotland and Northern Ireland voted against it, of, of being part of a, a single market that one wants, but without freedom of movement, to some extent without freedom of services, um, that is however not rationally uh, explainable. Um, that has to do with wanting to keep a world that is not there anymore. You know, I, I agree with everything that's been said, and it just sort of, um, you know, an interesting thing about what we're seeing in Europe compared to the United States is that um, 
as sort of mentioned, this is not a question at breakfast. Brexit is not really a question about sort of openness to trade, right? Um, some surveys show that um, you know those voting in favor of Brexit thought that you know the, that the UK would have more flexibility and greater ability to engage in free trade, right? It really was, especially among those voting to leave, uh, that immigration was the number one uh, issue that they're voting on. That they're very hostile to immigration across a number of a number of dimensions. Um, and, and I may be misremembering uh, this, but um, you know there is some work maybe in, in the U.S. or in uh, the U.K. showing that it's the, actually the change in exposure to to migrants, or that it's this this in these areas where you get increasing sort of immigration that um, are sort of uh, experiencing some of this like greatest uh, hostility. Um, I guess uh, I had a slightly different comment about the challenges of sure. Brexit. Yeah, you but, I, I, if we're going to keep talking about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I just yeah. say one yeah, thing sure. in response? So one thing that that's uh, I find fascinating, and it's based on a, a paper that was published very recently in the American Political Science Review, and it, it indicates that there's this very interesting connection between economic change and cultural fears. And it's uh, Colin, Tony, and Stanek. Is that the? And what they show, actually, which is just fascinating, is actually exposure to trade does a better job of explaining those anti-immigrant attitudes that drive support for Brexit than exposure to immigration, which is what Walter said, right? So it's not people who are exposed to immigration um, that have these anti-immigrant attitudes, but people who are exposed to cheap imports, regions that have been devastated by cheap imports are more likely to have these anti-immigrant acts. So that's why there's this, there's this very complicated relationship between um, economic globalization as a source of not just economic change, but social and cultural change that's like um, activating these latent fears that people have about immigration. But so that's just my comment. Yeah. Good, good, good. Um, Duke uh, needs to, to run to class. So thank you very much. Um, so we will continue uh, um, the conversation. Eric, did you want to pick up on? I was just going to say it. I'm sort of enough, uh, another interesting challenge uh, that Brexit raises for the EU is this idea of what these disintegration referendums you generally, uh, the remaining members of the EU, and um, you know, sort of the politics surrounding. You know the EU's negotiation position um, with the UK, but also how um, individual member countries or the EU try to sort of influence outcomes of these referenda as they occur. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of uh, some really interesting work being done on on this point. So, mm -hmm. so I think you know what we're seeing is this is a much more complicated. Um, uh, you know, trying to both not under only understand sort of the the vote for. A referendum like Brexit, but also trying to understand support for these far right parties, that it is a much more complicated sort of, um, uh, situation, um, both focused on sort of a, you know a cultural ex uh, explanation as well as a as an economic one too, and that one is you know perhaps feeding the other as well. So um, I, uh, I think that's what we're seeing. Um, so I want to. Um, uh, Return, sort of move on a bit, perhaps, and, and we can, of course, get back to, to, to some of these, but um, maybe back to a little bit talking about, um, you know, the single market sort of itself and really kind of maybe uh, trying to evaluate um, if it's done what it's set out to do. Um, remember, this was, as I you know, sort of started out with the introduction, right? This was kind of the, the goal of the, 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 the founders of the, of the EU from the beginning, which was to create this common market and this movement, uh, free movement of, of, of not only of the good services, uh, persons and capital, um, and to sort of reflect a bit on, you know, now that we have had this for 25 years, um, and obviously it was a, um, a, a work in progress for many years before that, um, of, you know, really, have we seen, uh, what is the sort of assessment, sort of looking back over 25 years? Um, has, 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 have we gotten to where um, Dolores perhaps wanted us to be in the mid-80s, or is there still a long ways to go, given these challenges that we started to talk about? Valjo, do you want to? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it is a success that under the worst of crisis as we had recently, you couldn't see a major revival or attempt at protectionism. 
of course, there were attempts to, when you had bailout programs, to target that mostly to your national car industry or your national banks. But the state aid and the supervisory roles of the Commission were quickly uh, uh, adjusted to that, became more lenient, but also reined in the worst of these attempts. Uh, for example, um, the, 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 the French uh, attempt at doing a car rescue program that was only targeted at uh, uh, Nissan and Renault, uh, no, not Nissan, Renault and Peugeot. Uh, and they were told that for the next three years, in 2008, uh, 2009, they could not close down any uh, factory in France, which made immediately Eastern European uh, of governments fear that then Peugeot and Renault uh, subsidiaries would be closed down in, in their countries if, if uh, capacities had to be closed down, as was very much feared at the time. And the Commission came in very forcefully on behalf of the Eastern European countries and prevented that. So Sarkozy had to withdraw from this plan because it is discrimination and non-discrimination on grounds of nationality is really a fundamental value of the single market. So that was upheld. But of course, we also say, saw how fragile the success in this respect is. So. In financial services, there were cases where, for example, the supervisor of one member state, and in this case it was Germany, ring-fenced liquidity, meaning it did not allow an Italian subsidiary in Germany that had all this liquidity coming in because Germany got this role of a safe haven to be repatriated to the mother bank in Italy, which was starved of liquidity. The supervisor in Germany said, well, we need all the liquidity we can get in this situation. It will have pure national competence and therefore uh, actually risked that the Italians had even more problems than, than they had already. So that is clearly something that had to be changed and the banking union now did change that because uh, that would not be possible anymore under the new new uh, regime. Another um, uh, issue that I, I think I, I looked at is, of course, this free movement. We thought for a while even that that is actually welcome because, you know, the young, highly educated, sometimes skilled, could move into these aging, mature economies of the North, and they would be even welcomed there. Germany put up a kind of training, vocational training program for young Italians and Spaniards. Um, later also Syrians and so on, to train up these people for a, a manufacturing industry that was quite keen to have them. But the backlash came as well a uh, bit uh, after a while, and we should perhaps not be so surprised. It is quite normal that political backlashes come after systemic financial crisis. There's a, a much cited paper by um, uh, some scholars at the Free University of Berlin that have looked at 140 years of systemic crisis at 800 elections and find that right-wing extremist parties after, uh, uh, after systemic crisis increase their vote share by 30 percent on average. So what we see in, in the EU and that then leads also to these regulatory nationalistic uh, uh, reflexes is what unfortunately we have to expect and the single market just shows that it, you know, the strongest rules for a single market constructed between nation states will not prevent that. Great. Well, I think something that, you know, perhaps is, you know, on everyone's mind and obviously has come up, a you know, I suppose the two things that have come up a couple of times are both um, the U.S. And, and the current leadership of, of the U.S. as well as obviously Brexit and sort of, uh, um, you know, the, the post-Brexit world that we are slowly perhaps moving towards, although um, one doesn't know what's going to happen in the next couple of months, but, you know, assuming that that and that, that is the reality um, to sort of think about what, you know, what the single market will look like um, in this post-Brexit, um, you know, U.S. Trump-led U.S. world with perhaps, you know, with Germany and France really leading 
um, you know, the market and, and really serving as the major players. So how does, you know, what does that um, do in terms of, of, of the market and, and, and how does that, um, you know, what does that look like? Um, Erica, do you want to jump in on that? Sure. So, so I, 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 the way that Jude put it, uh, you know, sort of thinking about like what kinds of policies could mm -hmm. possibly, uh, you know, address this or what kind of sort of leadership from mainstream political parties, um, I think really gets at like what I think is the mm -hmm. core uh, question going forward. Um, and I wonder if maybe um, one way we could think about this or is to see like what happens in the wake of Brexit and how the UK does like, um, it's going to sort of shape, I, I would imagine sort of expectations within the remaining members about mm -hmm. how they, you know, sort of how individuals there view sort of their position like in the EU or not as whether, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, how badly or, you know, mm -hmm. how not so badly uh, things happen to the UK. So maybe there's, um, you know, lessons to be learned uh, like as, as we sort of um, go forward and see how Brexit unfolds. Um, and that will have sort of important implications for sort of the cohesion of um, mm -hmm. the remaining members in the market and you know how they push forward on mm -hmm. these sort of continued integrations mm -hmm. and, and, and and also how the agenda perhaps changes right. and sort of an ever evolving uh agenda that, right that we're seeing uh Belcher, do you want to uh jump in on this at all yeah i mean on the one hand the UK leaving the European Union is an impoverishment for both sides. Um, the UK uh, was an important, also diverse voice in the regulation. I'm a great believer in not following just one paradigm. There is something to be said about diverse voices in evolving markets. I think one of the problems that led to the big crisis was that we had all signed up to more or less one regulatory paradigm and the UK was always more liberal and while I'm not necessarily on the more liberal side it had also sometimes uh, you know valid arguments that the others had to to argue against when the, the more uh, the less liberal uh, regulation was often also um, ba barely couched in, in, in uh, of nationalistic interests so we lose that we lose part of that market depending on what the eventual outcome will be the eu as a whole in terms of i mean it shows everybody how difficult it is to get yourself out being back in control because that i think is a complete myth whether you are really outside or in a customs union or somewhere in the other it is too big a guy on the block for you to to be autonomous anymore even when they don't want to rule over you they will because it's just too many businesses follow their rules and so it imposes this um, rule taker status on you the the european union and the single market i think also with the help of your present president uh looks more attractive by the day what is often uh, you know, seeing against it, and this is true, this rule-based, very inert, slow-moving tanker type of regulation suddenly looks actually quite attractive. It's reliable, it's safe, you know what you get, they come to decisions after all, you know, the, 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 the new steps of integration that were made in the last 10 years are astounding by any measure, you know, a banking union within two years of the biggest banking market in, in the world, that is no mean feat. So they do move, but they move slowly and they move relatively um, in, 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 in steps that you can see where they're coming from and there will be no surprises, let's put it that way. The one big surprise that the banking union brought was that it split actually the single market. As you may know, the financial services was originally a single market issue. That's why we also could not for the Euro area have one supervisor but it was the UK that when the crisis escalated in 2012 that said do whatever you want as long as you reign in this this euro area crisis and we even give you the ECB as the single supervisor 
but we are out of that then. And so since then, financial services are regulated more inside the euro area than across the single market. So we look from that legacy of the, of the long way out by the UK, we have now in one important area, a split single market, and that's a legacy that, that will be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to um, give uh, the audience a, um, a chance now that we've talked about some of, of uh, brought this to the to the present a bit and talked a bit about sort of the, some of these challenges um, that, um, that that the, the market is facing to see if there's any any questions from those here or broadly. It's actually about the topic of, of mainstream and anti-mainstream bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the, in, in the last decades, the mainstream parties started looking pretty much alike in many of the Western European countries. And the anti-mainstream parties, they, they appeared as an alternative to this centrism of, of, of mainstream parties. But in the same way, uh, we usually, when we're talking about anti-mainstream parties, we're looking at Eurosceptics, but there are also new anti uh, non-mainstream parties like uh, uh, Ciudadanos in Spain, in Malta, in France, Liberal Alliance in, in, in Denmark, and somehow the reappearance of FGP in Germany that represent cases of, of new parties or, or re-emerging parties that support the single market. Do they play any role in this newer, in this reorganization of European politics? So Ida, would you like to jump in? Walter, do you want to? Is the I'm question, do you see all these parties as Eurosceptic? Um, these parties there are actually, so I think the, the, the point was that there, that there are all of these newer parties that are not Eurosceptic, right? That are actually, um, you know, Europhilic parties and, and that are um, active participants in um, the traditional kind of um, discussion on the single market um, and sort of, is that gonna shift the balance of power, I think? Um, uh, it's a bit That's difficult the at the moment to say, <laughs> sorry to not to be more specific, but we have in May 2019 next year, the European Parliament elections. It's not quite clear what's going to happen then. If we follow the usual pattern, we should expect that actually some of these populists or challenges in power do worse because it's always the, the parties in government that do badly, they get a kind of punishment in the um, in the European elections, uh, whether then these parties do strongly would depend on whether they're in government or outside. Uh, there's always a bit of a of an anti-government sentiment in these European elections. We also don't know how strong will the voter, uh, you know, it has gone down to almost US levels, 40% or something in non-normal, in, in normal times in your country. So, we don't quite know what's going to happen. The, the next elections in May 2019 are really quite decisive and interesting. At the moment, from all the parties you mentioned, I don't have the impression that they push anything. The European Parliament is still a bit of a weak actor in the daily politics. It has played an important role in financial re-regulation and so on. But for these trends, what's happening in the single market and what will be the new agenda, national political parties do not play a big role. What has played a big role recently is what is called this New Hanseatic League. That is a group of small, mostly Northern Eastern European countries under the leadership of the Dutch. The, the Netherlands is quite unhappy with this German French axis that they try to push through reforms that they all feel is, is way too much. So it is perhaps more anti-Macron than anti-Merkel, but they clearly have several times said, you have to negotiate it with all of us. It cannot be the case that you two always, uh, you know, kind of agree what's done and then that will be done in one way or the other. So I, I assume these, relatively successful smaller economies make their weight a bit more felt together and will go for reforms, for example, in the services sector and so on in the single market that they are important to them. 
And I, so I'll just follow up a bit on uh, what uh, Walter was saying too. I think, you know, what we're seeing is really sort of a, a shift in some respects where the, the, the conversation is moving away from sort of the mainstream parties, right? To whether it's the Eurosceptic parties uh, or just sort of newer parties like on March in France or Ciudadana versus Spain that are not the Eurosceptic parties, but that they're not necessarily the traditional mainstream left and mainstream right parties. And so we're shifting, you know, where the, you know, sort of the debate is happening away from the, the mainstream parties to, I don't necessarily want to say the fringes, but to these new parties. And so I think that's what we're going to be seeing in terms of where the debate is, is perhaps is perhaps moving forward and a response, a response to that. Like Walter mentioned with the Hanseatic League, which is very much a response to Macron and this unmarched and this sort of new centrism that that he is uh, and the party is really trying is is really trying to push. Uh, but I do think that um, what Walter was saying is that uh, also uh, just to sort of emphasize the the elections that are coming up and that this we always see this strong tendency against the governing parties and some of these parties, namely Macron's in France, is a governing party. And so you know well, how that's going to you know play out and if we're going to see an anti-Macron norm, uh, you know, as we would expect from what sort of the second order um, election kind of um, research would tell us, or if we're actually going to see uh, you know, sort of uh, a different result and sort of support, perhaps, because it is, um, you know, challenging in some ways the status quo, but in some ways not. So I think we're sort of really at this point of seeing what in some respects happens in, in these elections and how some of these um, newer but non Eurosceptic parties um, are, are playing um, as well. Um, this is where the moderator gets to have a, a, a role when it's, when it's something that I, <laughs> I my own research touches on. Um, is there another, any other questions? Yeah. Just quickly, um, I was thinking that there is kind of a vacuum when it comes to analyzing the far left. Like we are all obsessed with the far right as the main <laughs> enemy of. Uh, as, as the main Eurosceptic force, but mm -hmm. the far left in many European countries is as Eurosceptic and as anti-trade, well, even more anti-trade than the far right. Mm -hmm. So I wonder why there is such a low interest in analyzing that. Like we have big far left parties like Podemos in Spain, Mélenchon in, in France, and they not only share this anti-trade message, but they are kind of morphing now and incursioning into the anti-immigrant message as well specifically tied to the low wage narrative and foreigners low wages for nationals. So I wonder uh, where you place those parties and also uh, the fact that many of them are shifting their strategy and going into the, the far right territory on immigration, what, are, what that tells us about these economic losers thesis, is that really a good ex explanatory factor of the anti-globalization backlash or is it more like the cultural factors, which based on what I read, like most studies find more evidence on the cultural thesis than the economic losers thesis. And if that is the case, then the embedded liberalism thesis or solution is not a very good solution to avoid the backlash against mm -hmm. Euro or integration. Mm -hmm. You want to? So uh, I'll say one thing and then I, I know I want to answer. Um, so uh, agreed, right? I mean, so you could look, the, the example in the US would be Bernie Sanders versus right. Donald Trump, right? So um, I think it seems, you know, clear my sense uh, is that sort of these right parties are better able to mobilize on sort of these cultural or identity kinds of questions and maybe the far left, if they're moving into sort of immigration, that hasn't happened in the, U in the US on the far left, but um, would suggest that sort of these class-based cleavages are not going to be salient enough um, and mobilizing enough to get folks uh, motivated. Um, my my own personal opinion on this is that sort of if we're talking about especially individual level studies that are looking at sort of um, the economic losers from globalization, oftentimes we don't do a great job of sort of theorizing and measuring who those lo losers are. But I do think when we look sort of at these sort of like more aggregate level in terms of say like outcomes on voting, we do see sort of this role still for, for globalization, although I agree with Jude, it's, it's part of the story, but not the whole thing. And so what we wanna figure out is like, you know, how, how do these two things interact and for whom um, do certain issues become, become salient, right? I think we just don't have a great answer for that, but. Uh, I mean, I think you have 
so we have already admitted that the, the economic loser is probably not the whole story. But if you think of these, what we tend to think, I think, in, in European political research from my colleagues, uh, call them anti-austerity parties. I would also not say they are necessarily Eurosceptic. They often say we want a Europe of the people, not a Europe of big business or Europe of the bankers. And, you know, fair enough. And I would also say there, I find it really difficult to distinguish between a genuinely political movement that says this Europe has to be a different Europe than the one we had, and an economic loser's argument, because young people in Southern Europe really had their life chances brutally curtailed. And they, the indignadas, the name almost says it, you know, they indignated about and totally annoyed and pissed off, frankly, from what has happened. I think we, we talk less about them, partly because we're not quite so worried about this. This seems to be something one can understand, why there is this movement, just like the Occupy movement was totally expected. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that through Syriza, uh, they, that was a bitter experience for that whole uh, uh, movement and the hopes it had, maybe that there would be a government that could stand up to the EU. But of course, when you are the, the government of a debtor country that needs the bailout, uh, if you don't want to completely uh, impoverish your pensioners or your uh, whatever, the whole country, a country to what Varoufakis says, then you are in a situation where you say we could actually not show that another Europe is possible. And that was a bitter blow for, for these these movements. That's why they don't have the same virulence as, as right-wing anti-Eurosceptic parties. Um, so my question is just to what extent should we be thinking about um, trade as being uh, dis a, a distinct issue from immigration? Because uh, in some way, the debate seems to be that uh, we're seeing anti-integration, anti-immigration parties. But on the, as you were just saying, we're also seeing some parties who are still uh, pro-Europe, pro-trade, but anti-immigrants to some extent. So I, I don't know. They seem like two sides of the same coin. And I don't know if we can think about them as separately as we have been. Or just any insight on that. Erica, do you want to go first? So, so I'll just sort of generally say, like, I think this, and this is happening sort of in IPE generally, like this sense that we need to start looking across issue areas to understand where policies uh, are substitutes or complements for each other, or how pressures on one issue might affect other policy outcomes is, you know, um, I think something where we still have a lot left to learn, but there are some theories that can help us sort of think about this and, and you know, um, Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that, right? So, so th that yes, I think um, in some cases, right, um, we could think about immigration and trade policy sort of having, uh, being complements or being substitutes, um, especially in a case where trade policy is less, uh, less of a topic um, or less room to maneuver than you could imagine immigration becoming more significant. Mm -hmm. Walter? I completely agree what was behind the question and one couldn't, uh, you know, interrogate the whole uh, hopes of the Brexiteers or of some UK positions on EU membership more than with this question. Even some moderate people always had this idea, oh, we just want to have the single market without freedom of movement. You could even say Theresa May has exactly that position. And it's an, I'm afraid, untenable position. It's economically illiterate. So much money these days is made, we have a hard time to measure it, but in value change, in supply value change, where, uh, chains, where, you, where it's no longer that, you know, the good is produced somewhere in your country and then it's shipped over to the other country. The, the good that is produced has a lot of services input that you source from all over the planet. The good may, until it's finalized, three times cross your border um, and whole factories shift with 
men and women power that they have knowledge services know-how legal uh, patterns property rights and so on that move to to places because you want this regularity alignment so that you can have along this value chain uh, seamless production that's one example the other is services it is often thought that germany is still that manufacturing powerhouse and everybody uh, smells the fuel and the dirty hands of these blue color workers actually a very big chunk of what manufacturing industry in germany uh, you know does is installing uh, production processes in other countries and it sends its engineers there to install that and has service uh, contracts where it goes back and forth so in order to to sell these machines that are complex have a lot of automation in it and so on it also needs to send people to make these processes work that is all services you need people to move as well when you want to sell your goods especially when you're a bit up the value chain um, uh, and have more complex goods to sell so in that sense it cannot be distinguished now you could say you would let only the highly qualified and so on move but um, you soon come into this this position that it's very difficult to say is is a clerk that that does the accounting for certain processes qualified or not qualified could you source that from a, from home is the engineer available in your host country or not you don't know uh, and so the two things really go together and uh, brexit will teach us that over and over again um, i think that's that's um, a really good point to to maybe draw to uh, move to to a, a conclusion i think what we've really seen here is that we can't talk about this common market or the single market without talking about some of the major sort of economic and political um, issues that are on the table today in Europe, right? Um, we've, as, as, as the conversation has turned, we've, uh, we've covered trade and immigration and globalization, the rise of the far right, um, as well as, as, as the left, um, and, and thinking about the uh, European elections that are coming up, uh, that are coming up in May. So I really think that this, in some ways, uh, has tied this conversation um, together in the sense that uh, we started with this idea that, uh, you know, Europe can't be Europe without a common market. And I feel, and I see that the, the common market itself has really um, led to so much of the, 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 these issues um, and debates that, that, that we're currently having. Um, and so um, one thing that then I would like to, for us, perhaps us, for us to think about is, you know, uh, in 25 years, we'll have a single market at 50. Um, and with all of these uh, things that we've been discussing, um, you know, this is a bit of sort of speculation, but uh, where are we going from here um, with knowing what we know now, um, which is perhaps more or less than we knew 25 years ago, um, but with so many of these, these changes, um, both within Europe and, and on the world stage as well, um, do either of you want to sort of offer your uh, thoughts, thoughts on this or on any of these related topics that we've, that we've been talking about? I know that's a big question. <laughs> Erica, do you want well, to? I so I guess I have a. So I have, I have one thought. Oh, I have one thought on this, and then I guess maybe just a question sure. for the group. Um, so I, my thought on this is, generally speaking, across the advanced economies, um, that there is going to have to be a way to sort of reconcile um, sort of the ability of firms to. Um, engage in various production strategies that are going to benefit them at the expense of workers um, and sort of thinking about how to get workers interests reflected in policy again is a big question that has to be answered across a number of countries um, not just in the eu and without doing so we're going to see continue to see this sort of political conflict and so it's going to take a lot of sort of um, political innovation um, and i don't know whether that's in the form of like universal basic income or something right to sort of um, to, to try and move forward. And so um, maybe this will reveal my ignorance, but um, I guess I wonder if, if uh, EU people think about this at all, um, sort of like Danny Roderick's political trilemma, that like the strategy forward, if you're gonna have sort of like full uh, integration in an economic sense is gonna require either 
sort of a lack of democracy at the local level or sort of like greater political integration. And so I guess I wonder mm -hmm. if further sort of like political integration and delegation from the national to the EU level is something that people expect to see or think would help resolve this mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what we're often seeing is that, you know, perhaps less delegation and more, you know, as more competencies shift to the EU, um, the, uh, we're seeing that the, the member states, um, you know, perhaps not so much by, by choice, but we're seeing sort of that, that um, evolution of political integration, at least from sort of the EU down. Um, and so I think, I think we are, we are seeing that um, as well. And we'll be seeing, you know, I think, um, as integration continues, we'll be seeing more of that, um, and then how that then influences um, many of the things that you discussed. Um, Walter, do you want to offer your uh, predictions of the future? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, Danny Roderick's trilemma figures very highly in our courses. Um, I had last year a, a one-term course that was totally around this trilemma, so it is um, on our mind. The single market at 50, well, it will be grayer and older looking like all of us. Um, seriously, the demographics of Europe is such that we are aging. To some extent, you could say Japan is our future uh, in the sense of Japan has already an employment force that declines by 1% per year. It's still growing at 1%, which frankly is actually not so bad when you think about it. A productivity growth of 2% is what not every European country manages, especially not the UK. And it has partly to do with what Erica just said, namely that in a way labor has become too cheap. So firms employ workers very extensively, don't care much about training them up because they're not so expensive that you have to, you know, get productivity out of them. The silver lining in all this is, especially for those I can't see at the moment, but in that room with you, is that the bargaining power of, of, of labor, of young workers should become stronger. There will be soon skill shortages and automation will not take away all of them. The more you are in personalized services, the better for you. Uh, the more you do routinized jobs, the worse. But overall, I think we have reached a bit of a bottom in terms of, of exploiting this surplus labor that has come on world markets with China. And I have no regrets about it because it was the biggest anti-poverty program that the world has ever seen. But at the same time, for the more mature countries, the advanced countries, it was a hit to labor rights and to the welfare of workers. But I think these times come to an end. And like Erica says, firms have to think about how to retain workers in the future and make work more fulfilling, more interesting, and use the skills that are in abundance there uh, in, in a way that people actually want to, want to keep doing it. I think that's, that's uh, given us quite a bit of, of, of food for thought. Um, with that, I want to um, uh, end this and thank our, our panelists. Thanks to Walter Road and Erica and um, is in class at the moment. Um, this was, and to our audience as well, um, thank you for all the participation and great questions. Um, and I think uh, we all have a lot a lot more to think about and, and, and um, as, as we uh, uh, celebrate the 25 years of this. Um, very ambitious project that the EU uh, put forth in, the, in, in, in 1993 and uh, see where it takes us. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.